Good evening and welcome everyone to this evening's webinar on the National Infrastructure Bank. We will be giving you an update on what's happening around the country and the positive results that we're seeing from our efforts at educating and raising awareness on the importance of this significant legislation. My name is Julie Olson. I'm the chair of the Progressive Caucus for the Alaska Democrats and I'll be your moderator this evening. First, we have uh, a message for y'all from uh, one of our very important sponsors, Congressman Jesus Tree Garcia from Illinois. Now let's roll the video. I wanna thank you for holding this meeting. I'm very excited to talk about the National Infrastructure Bank Act, and I wish I could be with you live. As you know, this legislation was introduced by my colleague in Congress, Congressman Danny Davis, who is actually my district neighbor representing Illinois 7. And I'm joined by representatives Jonathan Jackson, Raja Krishnamurti, and Delia Ramirez as co-sponsors of this legislation, which is so important to our communities. I'm proud to be Congressman of the Illinois 4th District and a senior member of the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee. And I'm also an urban planner. I have a master's in urban policy from the University of Illinois at Chicago. It is through my experience as a student of urban policy, a public official, and as a resident of the city of Chicago that I know how fundamental infrastructure is to equity and opportunity. Where projects are chosen to be built is not random. Drive through my district and you'll see the ramifications of disinvestment and segregation by design. Whether it's a highway or an empty lot, it can stand as a barrier to access to schools, child care, jobs, and sometimes it can even make a difference between life and death if you can't get to a hospital. And we are at a critical point in the history of our nation's infrastructure. I was proud to help pass the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, or IIJA, which is bringing $17 billion in infrastructure investments to Illinois alone. These funds will help address legacies of disinvestment and build more equitable and sustainable communities. But even as we work to implement this once in a generation piece of legislation, and even as we work to ensure that the projects funded are responsive to community needs and historic injustices, we must continue to work for more. The IIJ is great, but it's not enough on the infrastructure front. I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but there is growing public awareness on the need to rebuild our infrastructure. And as we begin to see the fruits of these investments, we must take advantage by pushing for a national infrastructure bank. Let's run through a few quick facts. Congressman Davis's bill would create a five trillion public bank for infrastructure projects. It would require no new federal appropriations and it would not create new federal taxes. Importantly, it would not require legislators to continually approve funding, ensuring that necessary projects don't get blocked by partisan gridlock. Like we've done in the past, it would use treasury debt to capitalize the bank. The IIJA includes $15 billion to replace lead pipes nationally. In Illinois alone, it's estimated we need $10 billion to replace all the lead pipes. The gap between what's been funded and what the need is is staggering. The National Infrastructure Bank would generate enough money to replace all lead pipes within a decade. The IIJA includes billions to repair our bridges. A national infrastructure bank would have the funding to complete that work, and Illinois has many bridges. Chicagoland is our nation's rail hub. A quarter of all freight trains pass through the area. The IIJA includes billions to improve rail safety and expand passenger transit. A national infrastructure bank would have the funding for thousands of miles of high-speed rail. And we could keep going, but suffice it to say, now is the time 
to keep on fighting for a national infrastructure bank. We have the momentum. I thank you all for your work and your continued advocacy, and I look forward to our future collaboration. Thank you, Representative uh, Garcia. Uh, we are so fortunate to have smart and thoughtful representatives like uh, Mr. Garcia as supporters of the National Infrastructure Bank legislation. We're uh, very pleased to report that we are up to 32 co-sponsors at this point, uh, illustrious and accomplished representatives like um, Congressperson Adam Smith from Washington, a conservative Democrat, uh, all the way to um, Alexandria um, Cortez from um, New York. So um, a great um, list of co-sponsors, and we're hoping to add more and to add co-sponsors from your state as well. Um, we've got here the, our speaker list. We have a great lineup of speakers for this evening, so we're going to get right to it so we can get through everybody and then have time for Q&A at the end of our presentations. So with that, we're going to go right to Alfeca Mutardi. Alfeca is the senior economist for the National Infrastructure Bank Coalition and has spent her career with the International Monetary Fund. Alfeca? Thank you very much. Appreciate it. And welcome to all of you. Great to see so many new uh, faces that we've seen before and uh, new folks as well. So our theme today is, of course, uh, Mother Hubbard's Cupboard is Bare. And the cupboard that is bare is the financing cupboard to finance all of the infrastructure projects that we need. Traditionally, there are three sources of infrastructure financing, federal and state budgets, and private capital markets. But all of those are dwindling. Let's start with the federal budget. We now have a national debt of $34.7 trillion. Uh, interest on the debt is now greater than defense spending. And the Congressional Budget Office uh, projects that we'll continue to roll out deficits every year of between one and a half and two trillion a year. So it's gonna keep on getting uh, uh, larger this debt. In IIJA, as uh, Congressman uh, just mentioned, was always a little bit too small. It started out as $3.5 trillion, but because uh, senators couldn't figure out how to finance it through the budget, it got made smaller and smaller until it ended up at only half a trillion dollars. So it's a great start, uh, but it's not enough money, and it ends in a, in, in a couple of years. Therefore, from the federal side, it's pretty clear that there's about zero chance of more federal financing coming out of the federal budget for infrastructure. State and local budgets are also similarly stretched. Many are experiencing deficits and will have to curtail infrastructure investments or, and, lay, and or lay off uh, employees. If you want to see what each state's budget looks like, nasbo.org uh, has um, art, great articles on each one. But here are a couple of examples. Maryland's deficit means that $2 billion in transportation projects will need to be cut over the next few years. Uh, after their budget came out, of course, the Francis Scott Key Bridge was struck and uh, what got completely demolished. There's no money uh, to replace the Francis Scott P Key Bridge either in Maryland's budget or in the emergency budget from the feds. So uh, this is a place where the NIB can uh, uh, help with financing. New York State, uh, New York City and state budgets are inadequate to replace all of the lead service lines in the state. That needs 10 billion. Build affordable housing. A new budget was just announced, but uh, it, it doesn't have much more than a few tax breaks to try and stimulate affordable housing. Not sure that that's gonna work. Uh, nor to complete the gateway project or fix sewer overflow, seawalls, bridges, so many things. California now is running a deficit of around $73 billion. It has no added finance for high-speed rail, transit, and other things. And then private capital markets are also dwindling. Private uh, lending has not uh, generally gone to the real sector. The municipal bond lending uh, has been steady at $4 trillion over the last seven years, but some of the banks are going to get out of that business. Uh, Citigroup um, announced that it's going to quit the muni business because there's not enough return on for, for them to continue. And then higher interest rates means that uh, muni bonds will be more expensive. So those are uh, areas uh, where uh, the cupboard is bare. Meanwhile, the crises keep multiplying in the infrastructure arena. Um, there's a housing crisis. 
Home prices and rents are up 60% over the past decade, just 5% over the past year alone. Half of all homeowners, according to a Redfin poll, said that housing affordability would impact how they plan to vote in November. So they're really quite angry and stressed about the housing crisis. Bridges are in crisis. There's no money left to fix the key bridge. Uh, the, the federal emergency fund is broke. The uh, study found that there are 193 more vulnerable bridges where they could be struck by a ship uh, uh, that's ha happened in Baltimore. And in addition to that, 43,000 bridges around the country are in poor condition. Our drinking water is in crisis. There's new reports on water contaminated with lead, PFAs, arsenic, agricultural pollutants. This is causing cancer, cognitive impairment, and premature deaths. And much, much more needs to be done to improve the quality of our drinking water supplies. Our power is in crisis. Uh, this this last uh, month or two, there have been all kinds of articles saying that the demand uh, for uh, electricity is exploding, especially on account of uh, AI servers around the country. Uh, we're running out of electric power and climate heating will strain uh, systems even further. And then the labor is in crisis. Wages are uh, the lowest, for the lowest 40% have not kept up with inflation and workers are still fundamentally in low paying job, jobs. Meanwhile, the economy is also slowing. Uh, GDP, yes, just yesterday, uh, G, the uh, numbers for GDP growth in the first quarter came out. They've slowed to 1.6% compared to 3.4% in the previous quarter. Consumer spending and government spending had kept GDP growth up, but they're now dragged down by rising debt levels. CPI inflation is ticking upwards. It's going in the wrong direction, uh, now up to 3.5%. Core inflation is still twice the Fed's policy target. Unemployment has held below four percent for the last uh, for the longest stretch of time, um, and wages on average kept up with inflation. However, credit card debt is piling up. It's up twenty percent uh, over the last uh, since uh, COVID, and consumer sentiment is down. So, Fed um, has kept short-term interest rates unchanged. And long-term interest rates are catching up to the short-term ones. This means interest rates higher for a longer period of time, which will also slow the economy. Banks remain under stress and their profitability is down. So the NIB is the solution for all of these problems. It is an off-budget solution. It will grow the economy twice as fast as before. It fights inflation because it works on the supply side and it rebuilds budgets, both federal budget and state budgets because higher growth brings in more tax receipts at the same tax levels. So uh, it's really a great solution for everything. It'll create 25 million new great family sustaining wage jobs. Uh, it'll, as I said, raise economic growth. It hires and trains workers uh, and especially into these great paying fields. Uh, it supplies more goods. Uh, for example, our construction will need lots of steel and cement and better technologies. We want to prevent uh, food, you know, rocketing food prices because we're not taking care of the water supply to our agricultural areas. This bank can help with that. It'll resolve supply chain problems. It'll help with you know, climate change uh, benefits by lowering CO2 emissions, prevents a meltdown uh, in small businesses and state and local revenues. So it helps on all those areas and complements budgets. Recognizing all of this, uh, as uh, Julie mentioned, we are having great momentum on the bill. Uh, we are now up to 33 co-sponsors, including the main sponsor, Rep. Danny Davis from Chicago, Illinois. At least two states in America have 100% of their congresspersons on board. New Mexico, congrats. Rhode Island, congrats. We need to do a lot more work in large states with lots of members of Congress to bring them on board as well. California, New York, Pennsylvania, and so on. And that's where all of you come in to help. So we're really uh, looking forward to today's speakers and uh, hope to hear more on this regard. Thanks very much. Thank you, Alpec, as usual, for that great summary of uh, where we're at and a look at the um, the economy here in the U.S. Um, over the past several years, we've seen a huge re resurgence in interest in public banking in our country, and we're very fortunate to have with us tonight the chair of the Public Banking Institute uh, from Los Angeles, California. Please welcome Ellen Brown. 
Ellen, you've got the floor. Okay, thanks, Julie. Um, um, so I live in California, so I thought I'd talk about California's budget crisis and how it means that we're not going to meet our infrastructure needs, which are growing, particularly because we've had some weather disasters, et cetera. So two years ago, we celebra California celebrated a record budget surplus of nearly $100 billion, which was huge. Uh, but this was largely due to tax windfalls, and we got $43.5 billion in the American Rescue Plan Act money uh, due to COVID. But of course, those that money isn't forthcoming now. And suddenly... <laughs> Have a record deficit that's somewhere between 38 billion and 73 billion, depending on which office you ask. Uh, <clears throat> but anyway, it's huge, and uh, due to a number of unanticipated revenue shortfalls, including the fact that interest rates are up so high, so it's hard for businesses to borrow, which means reduced investment, slowed economic activity, stock market decline. And 1% of taxpayers pay nearly half of California state income taxes. So some one percenters and some corporations are moving out of state to find more favorable tax and regulatory uh, conditions. Let's see. Meanwhile, California has the highest unemployment and homelessness rates in the country. This, although $24 billion was spent in the last five years uh, on the homelessness crisis, and 30% uh, of the nation's homeless live in California, and nearly 9 million Californians are on the brink of being homeless. Uh, factors include that housing is too expensive for low-wage earners, so you have people like the... the um, Homeless unemployed who live in their cars and shower in the, at the club, you know, the athletic club and go into work. Um, and we have a lack of available uh, low cost housing. Uh, so some of the legislative attempts made by the by the California legislature actually have backfired. You can't really improve the wage situation by forcing employers to raise raise their uh, wages. Uh, just in this last month, uh, a bill was passed requiring fast food workers to be paid $20 an hour minimum wage as of April 1. As a result, we've seen uh, the workers have had, um, they've been, we've seen massive layoffs, reduced hours. This is just this month. Um, businesses have closed. Um, prices have ha been raised because, of course, the, the restaurant owners have very thin profit margins and they have to raise their prices to meet their costs. And some businesses are actually leaving the state. Uh, the legislatures are considering qu quintupling unemployment taxes and nearly doubling benefits. But you can, so this would obviously help the workers, doubling benefits but uh, it's likely to drive more businesses out of state. I don't know if you can see that, but it's, he says, congratulations on raising the minimum wage. That'll be $67.41 for your hamburger at McDonald's. The cure for unemployment is employment. Consider the Great Depression. Uh, unemployment in 1933 was at 25%, so it was huge. And yet by 1945, it had dropped to 2%. And uh, the banks were bankrupt. So how did they fund that? They used the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, which had actually been set up by Herbert Hoover to bail out the banks, but it, it hadn't worked for that purpose. So it was greatly expanded. Um, it started with, it was based on Alexander Hamilton's model, the first US bank, which was funded by um, capitalizing, it's funded, I, I, Alfeca didn't go into how the, how the bank would be funded, so I'll just say that a little bit. So it's you, ca it's capitalized by taking um, debt, by turning debt into um, trading debt for stock. And so it started, there, but actually that's not how the Reconstruction Finance Corporation was financed. It was, uh, it started with $500 million in capitalization from the government it issued bonds, it lent or invested over $40 billion over the next 25 years, funded the New Deal in World War II, rebuilt the depressed economy and returned a net profit to the government. 
Um, much of California's vital infrastructure funding or infrastructure was built with RFC funding, including uh, the San Francisco Bay Bridge, which is pictured, though you can't see it too well, but anyway, the top picture is the bridge being built and the bottom is the result. Um, many other things. Uh, the Rural Electrification Administration brought electricity all across the country. Many California co-ops were set up to bring electric power to the state. During World War II, the RFC created seven subsidiaries to help build the war effort. California had 129 defense plants and other defense projects built directly by the Defense Plant Corporation. And uh, the RFC provided the seed money for the Public Works Administration, which did many other things. Um, and the RFC bought many uh, PWA loans, sold them on secondary markets, and funneled the money back into the PWA for more projects. These included the Hoover Dam, pictured here, many other things, including schools, hospitals, roads, etc. But more needs to be done. The American Society of Civil Engineers, at their last report card, uh, gave California a rate of C minus. The solution, of course, is the National Infrastructure Bank, HR 4052. Uh, this is Alfeca's slide, but what's in it for California, you can see up to 588 billion over 10 years to cover all of the state's infrastructure financing gap. Uh, and it will create 2.9 2 million new great paying jobs for California families struggling to stay afloat. So that's all I got. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Alan. Really appreciate you being here and sharing that information with us. Next, we're gonna to turn to another Californian. Uh, we have with us this evening, Dr. Nomi Prinz. She's an author and former managing director of Goldman Sachs from Los Angeles, California. We'll turn it over to you, Nomi. Um, thanks a lot, Julie. Hi, everybody. Um, I actually just got back from Brazil today, so I am jet lagged, but also um, I just want to start with um, a conversation I actually had there that, that relates to infrastructure, which is that I was having a conversation with um, a congressman there, Bandeira de Mello. He was for 36 years the head of uh, the BNDES, which is Brazil's development bank, so effectively their infrastructure bank. Um, and over those 36 years, he was engaged in you know, multiple infrastructure projects from transportation to communication to energy to energy capacity um, and everything else. And we were talking about um, actually the National Infrastructure Bank here because I brought it up. Um, and he's, and, and I, I said, you know, it's very interesting that, you know, Brazil has one, China has one, many other countries have one, which we know, but but we don't. And he laughed and says, that, that's because you guys can print dollars and we can't. And, and I said, well, well, it's, it's true. We, we can, uh, you know, print or the Federal Reserve can create money um, with which to buy debt to put on its balance sheet, which has decreased um, over the last year as it's been sort of shedding uh, assets, but it's still about seven and a half trillion dollars worth of, of money that's basically uh, holding debt rather than going into the economy. Um, there's reasons for it and everything else, but the point being that um, if you actually want to invest in infrastructure, you have to direct that debt into infrastructure. Um, and as Ellen mentioned, as Alfeca has mentioned many times, the, the idea, the singular idea um, of, of repurposing existing debt is one of the tenants, one of the most important parts of the infrastructure bank, because by doing that, you're taking the debt out of just sitting around doing nothing, whether it's on the Fed's book or whether it's just on a pension fund book or whether it's on a bank's book that will later be pledged to the Fed in return for, for cash or liquidity when, say, JP Morgan or Citigroup or, or another Wall Street bank needs it. Um, and you're saying, no, it's going to go into bridges. It's going to go into hospitals. It's going to go into trains, uh, high-speed rail. Uh, it's going to go into energy capacity. It's going to go into fixing um, the grid, which is going to actually help not just local communities um, grow their economies foundationally, but also all the businesses that operate in those communities. Um, I didn't have time tonight because, well, I just got back, but I, I was looking at the list of, you know, the, the really incredible list we have of 33 co-sponsors for this bill in the different states um, that they come from. And we still have this situation where 
Republicans are not on the bill, which we, we do talk about um, every month. And it occurred to me, and I looked up all of the major states that actually use infrastructure funding from uh, the current bipartisan infrastructure law, and, and half of them are, in fact, uh, Republican-leaning states. So it occurs to me that if we're going to, um, which can potentially happen, um, run out of even the small amount, 10% of the funding necessary to actually fix all of our infrastructure um, that is coming from the bipartisan infrastructure law, uh, that that runs out or that stops or basically that law is going to um, expire um, in the next couple of years, uh, what do those states do? So then you're not even getting state funding from the federal government, but you're certainly not getting it down to the local level where it's most needed. Um, so we are in a, in a time crunch right now because of um, the fact that the bipartisan infrastructure law was not only not enough, but it also wasn't long enough. And not only are uh, major commercial banks retreating, as Elfeka mentioned, from the municipal bond market, from other bond markets, from all sorts of long-term uh, infrastructure projects that well, they, they were never in to begin with, but effectively long-term debt in general, because it's just higher uh, interest payments and they it's higher risk and they just don't want to deal with it. Um, but but we have a situation where debt's hanging out on the Fed's balance sheet. It's increasing literally every day. The cost of servicing that debt will be a trillion dollars by 2026, which really isn't that long uh, from now, at which time the bipartisan infrastructure law expires. So if we don't get this um, National Infrastructure Bank going right now, we, we actually risk forcing the expense of our infrastructure upgrading to be that much higher. So if you are any sort of a congressperson that is looking at any sort of worry you may possibly have um, about inflation or the cost of things or about what it looks like to have a, quote, five trillion dollar bank that's really only a half a trillion dollar uh, set of collateral from that debt, which which funds um, the rest of those that the money and loans, um, then you should really, really worry about what's going to happen in two years. Um, so, so I think we we have this this other opportunity um, right now as we have this momentum in collecting these signatures. And we have so much, so much grassroots state and local support for the National Infrastructure Bank, where it is most needed to help all of these foundational economies and projects um, that we really got to be this idea of inflation actually won't increase if we have a national infrastructure bank, but the inflated cost of funding any infrastructure will increase by so much more over the next couple of years, especially if we don't have initial funds uh, to subsidize um, any of those projects. And especially if we start to fund some of those projects and then we have to stop midway. Um, and as I've said before, you can't, you can't build half a bridge it's it's not useful. It will not work. And so um, we, we do have a situation where time is of the essence. And yes, we're going into an election year, but there's literally every state, uh, no matter uh, who it is run by, uh, and no matter which congressperson is assigned to which um, congressional district in those states, requires additional money than the amount of money that they have for infrastructure. Um, and as Elfeck has mentioned so many times, as we all know here, is um, even looking at the general health of any economy. Um, and actually, uh, this is something I was seeing in Brazil. I was all over the country. And, you know, you would think if it can be happening there, it should be happening here much more so. Um, there's a lot of foundational local economic projects. There's a lot of focus on the social and environmental and infrastructure development aspect of communities and how what's required at that level ultimately is, is funding growth on even the business side of coming into those communities because they can then provide jobs. Those provide jobs in particular industries that provides um, the need for hotels and restaurants and school programs and everything else. And you just get a more robust economy. Um, so I, I think right now we, we are in a situation where it's time to kind of shame um, <laughs> the Congress people that, that are not signing on to this bill and, and, and really to indicate that we have a, a strong possibility of, of an majorly enhanced cost, um, not just of debt to our country, but of the cost of fixing, upgrading, or repairing any infrastructure project as rates stay high, as debt goes up, as the cost of funding continues to rise, and as the amount of lending that comes from the private sector continues to retreat. Um, so we, we, we need this time. I know I'm speaking to all the choir here, but I think that's the message for anybody um, particularly on the other side of, of the aisle in terms of who have supported this most diligently, which are mostly Democrats. Um, I'm not entirely sure on the local level that it's all Democrats, but it's certainly uh, 
certainly that in in Congress, um, that that this is the time to really uh, to really step up, um, especially if you are concerned about inflation and cost. Thank you, Naomi. We really appreciate your insights here tonight. Okay, next we are going to call on a variety of elected representatives from around the country uh, to give us an update on uh, their thinking on the National Infrastructure Bank and the projects in their areas that are particularly important. So first we are going to go back to Illinois. Of course, Representative Danny Davis is our lead co-sponsor. And we have with us this evening, Senator David Kohler from Peoria, Illinois. He is a member of the Senate. Senator Kohler? Yeah, thank you. I'm David Kaler from Peoria. Right. That's all right. Uh, and I represent uh, Peoria and Bloomington Normal in the Illinois Senate. I'm an assistant majority leader. Um, I'm quite proud of the fact that uh, Illinois Congress uh, people are leading the charge on this uh, nationally. Um, just to uh, comment a little bit of, on what uh, Congressman Garcia said, uh, you know, even though Illinois has passed a, a huge infrastructure bill back in 2019. We passed a $45 billion infrastructure bill. And as the Congressman said, we've uh, received from the federal government an additional $17 billion. And that's, that's funding a lot of bridges, roads, uh, uh, schools, uh, universities, uh, you know, wastewater system projects. It still isn't enough. Uh, if you look at just what our uh, price tag would be on and improving the lead, or taking out the lead lines and improving our water drinking water systems, we're talking about uh, $10 billion alone. So this is a, a good uh, strategy for us to continue investment uh, into our infrastructure, because that's really the best thing for the economy. We've, we've seen that uh, really that kind of investment over the past several years has kept this economy going strong. And uh, that's, that's important because not only do we improve the infrastructure, but we do that by creating jobs here locally. Um, so, you know, I'm I'm proud of the fact that uh, Illinois has has made that commitment. I've been through uh, in my uh, nearly 18 years in the Senate. I've been through two huge capital bills. Uh, they have done a lot at the point in which they were passed, but still we're not able to keep up. I mean, I'm I'm uh, amazed at what the projections are from uh, on a national basis. That uh, for us to uh, maintain really the infrastructure that we have right now, that would be a six trillion dollar investment. So that means that, uh, that we're behind. Uh, I'm the sponsor of, of, of uh, Illinois Senate Joint Resolution 47, which says uh, we urge the United States Congress to pass HR 4052 to create a new national infrastructure bank to finance urgently needed infrastructure projects. And uh, that will be, uh, uh, we will conclude our, our spring session uh, at the end of May. Uh, we'll have that on the agenda. It'll be passed by the House and the Senate and we will uh, forward that uh, on to uh, our uh, federal representatives. Um, I'll, I'll just conclude with this. Uh, it does concern me that, uh, that the only folks so far seems to be those of us who are Democrats getting on board. Infrastructure should not be a, a partisan issue, and it never has been. When we passed uh, the bill in 2009, and then again in 2019 uh, in Illinois, that was a bipartisan effort. Uh, there are no Democrat roads and Republican roads. They're just roads and bridges and schools. And so uh, I think that uh, we need to kind of double down uh, with our uh, friends across the aisle and make sure that this becomes a bipartisan effort as well. Uh, uh, we have other uh, Illinois Congress people that need to get on board, and uh, I will assist in that effort. But I want to thank you very much for uh, inviting me to be a part of this important town hall. Thank you, Senator Kaler. Really appreciate you being here. I do want to say that we've had uh, multiple good conversations with Republicans around the country, and uh, we've felt uh, pretty positive about many of those conversations. And it is really unfortunate that none of them have been willing so far to sign up as co-sponsors. Uh, and, and I'm sure that we have conservatives on this phone call tonight. So it's not to say that conservatives are not so in support of this legislation. Uh, we just we just don't have a Republican co-sponsor yet. But that, but in that, we're asking for all of your help to uh, help us encourage them to sign on and, and come out publicly in support of making this investment in our country's infrastructure. We're going to go to Maryland, and we have with us Delegate Chow Wu, who is in the Maryland House of Delegates. Mr. Wu? Thank you. You've got the floor. Thank you, Ms. Olsen, for inviting me. I really appreciate it. Mr. Stood Rosenblatt, 
consistently called me to say you come in, you should come in. <laughs> and uh, I, I'm glad to really get to know your this group because I have a huge concern over the years about our infrastructure need. I, I served four years on the school board, one of the wealthy county, Howard County, Maryland, top 10 wealthy county in the country. However, we have a, around $1 billion infrastructure need. We're not able to find a way to fund. And every year we're crying. We have schools 70 years old. We're not able to renovate because we don't have money. And we have trailers, several hundred trailers in our school system. We have no money to really use a brick and board motor school to really house in our students. So there has been consistently need to renovate old school, fix HVAC system, or even just have a brand new windows. And we're not able to do that because there's no money. Even the state says they want to do some money, but our county couldn't come out with the money because they, they need a match. So think about top 10 wealthy county in the United States couldn't really renovate a 70 years old school. Think about how many other schools, how many other counties in the state have the similar issue. So I have been approaching our senators, Senator Chris Van Hollen, Senator Ben Cardin, and our Congressman David Chuang, Congressman Jim Sarbanes, Congressman, and I think another, Jamie Roskin. I, I, I talked to them every time I met them. I said, we need a national school infrastructure fund, maybe only $50 billion overall every year. I think we'll be able to address all the issues we're having now. Unfortunately, I don't see the huge appetite from our congressional leaders. And uh, I'm sometimes really a, a, a little of really disappointed because every time I see our country engage the war or funding other wars, like they got a like hundred billion dollars easily. And when they come back, say fifty billion dollars for the whole school system in the whole country, they couldn't come out with the money. I feel very disappointed, frankly. So but the Maryland State Delegate, I'm representing two wealthy counties in Maryland. One is Montgomery County, the, the largest one, the other in Howard County. And all the schools are facing the similar in, infrastructure need. We are not able to fund it. So we are trying to do something locally right now because we just couldn't wait. Our kids couldn't wait. And uh, at the same time, I really appreciate this group's efforts to think about it from national level, really think about roads, bridges and the public transit. Probably everyone heard about the key bridge issue right now because the collapse that's a huge, had a huge economic and uh, not only people lost life, but economic impact. And uh, because we didn't think about it, the, the bridge built older than me, but they never really do some reinforcement to think about how to prevent the collision through anything. So because there's no money there. So right now we try to, build a new bridge, key bridge, because there's a huge need, but we, we don't know how to fund it. Even our whole Maryland delegation had a bill, and I don't know how long it takes them for eventually get the money. It, it's really, it, if we got this National Infrastructure Bank ready, I think that we can do a lot of great stuff, like road, roads, bridges, public transit, and we need to think about it, have a safe drinking water, which would be part of the infrastructure need. And I remember that that uh, West Flint in, in Illinois, right? They got a, like polluted water and which had a leak. I remember that very well. I said, how can they do that? And it's really detrimental to our people in that state. And then we have some other like climate friendly transit, transportation mode should change. We really need a, a high speed trail, railroad along the East Corridor from really at least connect New York, Boston, Boston, connected, Maryland, even to, to Penn, um, Philadelphia. That's a really high density population area. And then clean energy, I would say another one we can do transportation, many other stuff. Maybe another topic we have never talked about really a lot is there's high speed internet access. Even in Maryland, we put a lot of money to really ensure in the rural area to have internet access. Sometimes they even don't have cell phone coverage because 
the private company don't feel it's profitable, they just don't want to do it, right? But it's 20, it's 21 century, right? I just feel without the internet, without phone coverage, it's unbelievable. I think we definitely need to do something from next, from the federal government level, and that way we really can coordinate the effort and really mobilize all the effort to improve the infrastructure. Good infrastructure, I would say, is crucial to economic growth and the safety and the overall, overall well-being of our people. I, I really hope something will happen and it can happen soon. Thank you. Thank you, um, Delegate Wu, really appreciate your insights. Uh, Maryland may be a small state, but they have large infrastructure needs, and, and it's real interesting to see this commonality of needs around the country. We've got many states that need investment in broadband uh, in order to improve education, to be able to enable work from home, remote working, and telehealth types of solutions. So thank you for sharing that those are concerns in your area as well. Okay, well, um, our next person I know is on, and we have with us Ray Allen Smith. She is the chair of Indivisible Albuquer Albuquerque and the treasurer of the New Mexico Democratic Party from Albuquerque, New Mexico. We have Ray Allen Smith. Thank you all for having me tonight. I am delighted to be here, and I'm really excited to tell you our great news that all of New Mexico's congressional delegation is in. All three of our representatives have signed on as co-sponsors. That was no small feat, but um, we got it done. Um, they know that New Mexico, what New Mexico needs, and as great as the president's infrastructure funding is, it's not nearly enough to bring New Mexico infrastructure anywhere near to what's going on in the rest of the country, like Congressman Garcia said at the top of this meeting. Did you know we have about 15,000 homes in New Mexico that have no electricity at all? Most of these are, in, are on indigenous lands. We have 10,000 homes with no running water in our geographically large but population small state. We have about 2 million residents and 80,000 households. 19% of those households have no internet. Many homes meet all three, no electricity, no water, no internet. Imagine that in 2024. During COVID, there were stories all over the news in the state about how parents were having to go to a nearby town. And when I say nearby, it might be 50 miles away um, and sit in front of a McDonald's or a Starbucks while their kids attended online school, getting internet from the parking lot of a McDonald's or a Starbucks. We have dirt roads that go to towns all across the state, roads that wash out when it rains. Most importantly, we have toxic waste from bomb tests. I'm sure you've all seen Oppenheimer. That happened here in New Mexico. They didn't even tell the residents they were doing that. And there are still impacts going on in the southern part of the state from it. We have... Um, uh, toxic waste from uranium mines, Air Force bases, radioactive storage facilities, all of which need cleanup. We don't produce a lot of radioactive waste anymore, but a lot gets dumped here. I'm sure you've heard of Carlsbad Caverns. Um, about 30 miles from there, there's a temporary nuclear waste storage facility that's anything but temporary. It's already been here 25 years, and there's no plan to use it anywhere. Um, and it's known for its problems. Um, we have PFAS in the Albuquerque drinking water where I live and certain parts of the city has have to have their water tested daily um, to see if it's safe to drink that day. Um, this, this is from PFAS in a gigantic plume that looms near our precious aquifer and it's in our grand, groundwater in the Rio Grande River. We have to fix all this. Our people here are suffering. We know that we need, we know what we need and our congressional delegation is all in. Our Democratic Party platform has contained language about the need for a national infrastructure bank for the last two years. There simply has to be a better way to fund these projects than depending on annual congressional budgets and that change when the wind blows. I'm happy to have just recently been elected to the state by the state central committee of the Democratic Party to represent us as the on the DNC platform committee as a person um, uh, DNC platform committee person at, at the convention in Chicago. And I ran for that position and was elected at, 
to that position for one reason, and that's to advocate for the National Infrastructure Bank to become part of the national platform and elevate it any, even more. So there's a lot of momentum here in New Mexico. And like I said, we are all in. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ray Ellen, and congratulations on being elected to the platform committee. That's a, a wonderful, a great accomplishment, and I'm sure you'll be very effective on uh, advocating for the NIB there. Okay, um, we are going to go back to Representative Art Handy from Rhode Island, who, uh, as I understand, is able to um, uh, get on the call at this time. Representative Handy? Yep. Um, am I unmuted? Yes, you are. Okay, awesome. Um, never sure. <laughs> um, I yeah, no, no. yeah, so, um, so I, I'm just giving an update. I think I, I assume somebody else has said it is some random point in time, but, um, I'm really happy that we both of our we, Rhode Island has two members of, uh, on the house and the house of representatives, both of them now are co-sponsors. Um, and, uh, I know, um, everybody at the, at the, at the, uh, uh, coalition there have been working on getting, um, uh, a Senate version in place. And I know that Senator Whitehouse is very likely, I would think, to be um, somebody that would be willing to co-sponsor from here too. Um, and I think if we had three out of four, we'd get Jack Reed, but we'll have to see. He's he's cautious. Um, you know, <laughs> it's been around a while and uh, hasn't been able to be around a while without being cautious, I suppose. Um, and um, and we definitely here in Rhode Island, definitely, I, I think more and more see the need, well, I've seen the need before this, but but I think Rhode Islanders are more likely to more and more see the need. We had the this big problem with uh, um, uh, Interstate 195, um, a real um, really important bridge to move people from the uh, East Bay section of Rhode Island onto into the main section of the Providence side, the West Bay area, um, has been damaged and doesn't look like it's going to be really fully repaired for about three years. Well, two years is what they're saying, so I'm assuming three plus. Um, based on how, you know, you guys all have the same stuff in your states. <laughs> um, so, uh, and it's, it's a major imp economic impact um, and um, really damages a lot of, uh, and also a public health concern because moving people back and forth to the uh, the major hospitals, things like that are a real problem. Um, I don't know that I have a whole bunch of other really fun, interesting facts to add. Um, I'm excited to hear about people getting more involved, being able to be a part of the um, uh, platform committee. I don't plan on being at the convention, but um, I'm happy to continue to try to advocate here. Um, but again, Congressman Amo just signed on. He's the newest member uh, from Rhode Island, that, that is, to sign on. And his predecessor was one of the original co-sponsors, or original, the co-sponsors of the legislation before he left um, Congress, David Cicilline, um, I know also was a co-sponsor. So Rhode Island, I think, has a, uh, um, we're a light lift, as it were, to get there. I think we'll be able to get us all, um, uh, get the get us behind it. And maybe maybe we can be the first state to have our entire delegation sign on to the, um, uh, the House and the Senate versions. That would be great. That is a great goal. Thank you, Represent Representative Handy, and uh, go get them is what I have to say on that. Okay, um, so before we go to the question and answer, I'd like to give a little brief update on uh, what the members of the coalition have been working on. So Ray Ellen Smith from New Mexico alluded to, to this a bit in her presentation, but we are working on getting resolutions passed in, in many states around the country and building state support to have a, a plank in the Democratic, um, uh, the DNC platform again this year at this convention in 2024. So here's an example you see on the screen of a resolution um, uh, that was passed, Washington State Democratic Party plank uh, that was passed by the first um, uh, legislative district Democrats there in Washington State. So this will be going to their statewide uh, convention and where they're hoping to get it into their state platform. So here in my home state of Alaska, we're working on that as well. Uh, as you heard Ray Ellen Smith uh, talk about uh, her successful efforts there in New Mexico. So we are doing this in states around the country. And of course, we'd like to help you um, get this plank in, in your state um, Democratic Party um, uh, platform also. So um, if you want some help or some ideas on how to go about doing that, please uh, contact our um, admin folks here at the National Infrastructure Bank Coalition. Uh, 
In uh, another um, piece of interesting news, uh, a couple groups, Our Revolution, I, I think many of you have heard of that, and the Progressive Democrats of America have been working on um, what they're calling a, um, uh, a progressive um, platform, essentially, for the Democrats with the idea that they hope to get many of these planks adopted by the DNC and included on the DNC platform. And so I think it's fantastic that both of, both of these nationwide groups are working on this. They've included a plank on the National Infrastructure Bank in it. And they're urging uh, their members to become involved in their state uh, party uh, platform committees and to try to get elected to go to um, the convention and to become a member of the, uh, the national platform committee. So we're really grateful to the efforts of our revolution and the progressive Democrats of America in urging the creation of a national infrastructure bank. Now, um, we have an updated flyer on our website, and so you can see here, we have the address for our website, the National Infrastructure Bank Coalition.com. This is a flyer that can be downloaded and uh, printed out in your location. So if you're going to a fundraiser and for one of your elected representatives, this is a great little flyer to bring along and uh, pass over to the member of your city council, your state representative, uh, a member of your school board to uh, educate them about this um, financing um, uh, mechanism that is possible that could address a lot of the infrastructure needs in, in your various uh, areas. So uh, it would be a great idea. Go to our website, download this flyer and read it, and then carry it with you and give it to, um, give it to anybody who might be interested, including your elected representatives in your area. On our website, we have an action page here, and I do want to point out a, um, a very important button, and that is the donate button. So our um, movement here, our, our website, our webinars are, are all funded by uh, your donations, frankly, and uh, every dollar that you can donate will help us to fund our operation, to do more outreach, to pay for advertising around the country. Um, we are currently, um, we have been spending more than we bring in, and so we definitely could use your, your help. Um, and if everyone who supports the coalition would just give something, uh, $5, $10, $20, we would be able to meet our monthly costs. And if you can sign up to be a monthly donor, even for $5 or $10 or $20, that amount is appreciated. And it really allows us to be able to, to budget for our expenses and to plan ahead for advertising and that sort of thing. I do want to say that we are planning on having a presence at the um, the Democratic National Convention, which I believe is in July this year in Chicago. Uh, that would include um, trying to uh, do a, a webinar or, or live presentation for all the members of the DNC. That would be really significant in terms of educating members of Congress on the importance of the National Infrastructure Bank. So again, any donations that you are able to make would be really helpful to us in being able to uh, pursue that goal. Okay, so thank you um, so much for sitting through that uh, little pitch there. And now we're gonna go to Q&A. So if you have any questions, if you've got a comment on the infrastructure bank, please raise your hand or um, you know put your hand up on screen and we would like to to uh, answer those questions and go to our panel of experts here. So uh, if you have a question, um, please please uh, put your hand up. And I'd like to kick it off by going to our economic experts and asking you um, to explain how growing our economy will help with the huge level of debt that our country currently has. So Dr. Prince or Alfeca, could either of you explain for our audience how that would work? Well, I could start and then we can jump in if that's okay. So uh, a good example of how this works is the picture of what happened to our debt after the end of World War II. We had just fought a war. We spent a lot of money uh, you know, financing the war and issued you know, war bonds and those kind of things, our debt was at 120% of GDP. The reason we measure debt as a percent of GDP is because the size of the economy is what allows any country to service its debt or to sustain its debt. Um, 
So it it fell very dramatically from 120% to 11% by the 1960s. How did that happen? Actually, none of the debt was paid back. It was that the economy grew so much faster because of the productive investments that were made by the Reconstruction of Finance Corporation and through that, the P Public Works Administration that e Ellen Brown just talked about. When you have higher investments in infrastructure, higher productivity, you can double your D GDP growth, then you have a whole lot more tax receipts coming into the federal go government to allow you to service the debt. And that's the same secret that this NIB will do. It will double debt, it will double growth, and uh, allow us to grow out of our debt situation today. In fact, it's probably the only way that we can grow out of it. Nomi, did you have anything to add? No, I just, I, I that that's absolutely right what you said, well, everything you said, but at, at the end there in terms of we we can't pay off this debt and we don't necessarily even have to pay it off, but, but we need to grow our economy more. And by having long-term funding, which is what the National Infrastructure Bank would provide, we also have the ability to plan um, for how those projects will evolve, for how to um, deploy people and educate people to take jobs, um, higher paying jobs to be parts of those projects or to be um, parts of businesses and projects that benefit from that infrastructure being built, um, which allows our country to grow from the foundation upwards. In those years after World War II, that's what was happening. It wasn't just the urban centers that were growing. We were basically growing a national highway system. We were growing national infrastructure. Um, we were growing national power. Um, and a lot of that also enabled smaller cities um, in states throughout the country uh, to become larger cities or at least medium-sized cities. And so that that's what we're looking at here is, is, is deploying financing without increasing debt that we can actually use to build the economy. And that means we will have that stable economic growth um, that is reliant simply on having the financing mechanisms there and having the people um, to be involved in the related jobs um, that will also pay back money into the economy. The more people that are working, the more people um, that are paying taxes. And we can debate the merits of businesses who should be paying more taxes and everything else. But the reality is when 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 there is more um, flushness in the e economy, then it creates momentum for itself. So so all of these little aspects culminate um, and be able to not just grow the economy, but to grow it in a very stable, more secure fashion. Thanks. Thank you, um, Nomi and Alfeca. Um, I'd like to throw out a question now to Senator Kaler from Illinois, and that is, um, you had mentioned um, reaching out to your Republican colleagues to get their support, and I'm wondering um, how you're going to broach it to them and what ideas you have in appealing to Republicans. And that's something I think many people on the call are facing. They're saying, hey, I have a Republican congressperson. Uh, how should I bring up the topic to to a conservative person? What what is going to appeal to them about the National Infrastructure Bank? Well, I think just the very nature of infrastructure investment itself uh, lends you know itself to a to a bipartisan uh, approach. Uh, every time we have passed a, a capital bill, um, you know the Re Republicans may not uh, be in line to vote for all the taxes for it, but uh, Generally, we have uh, uh, good cooperation in terms of putting the, the program together. Uh, even what uh, Congressman Garcia has said, look at our investment so far from the federal government in terms of interest infrastructure. A lot of that have, have gone into Republican states. And so I think we have to uh, uh, just appeal to people on the basis of what are the outcomes going to be? You know, we've got a problem right now. We, we can't afford uh, to fix our infrastructure uh, going about it in the in the normal way that we've been going about it. And that is, you tax a little bit, you try to spend a little bit. We've got too, uh, too big a problem right now. And uh, I don't want to repeat all the things that uh, our experts just said, but but that's why this thing makes sense. And so I think we have to appeal uh, to Republicans just on the basis of if we want a, an outcome where we grow the economy and we fix our, our infrastructure problems, then, then if it's not this, then what else is there? Right. So I would just approach them on that, that basis. Thank you. Thank you so much for those ideas. Okay, we have Daryl Ware with his hand up. Daryl, do you have a question or a comment? 
Can can you hear me, Julie? Yes. Yes, thank you. Um, I have a question slash comment. Is that okay? okay. Sure. All right. Hello, everyone. I haven't met. Uh, my name is Daryl Ware, and I'm the founder of Think Chief. Uh, first and foremost, uh, I like to thank Stuart for sending those multiple emails and making sure I hopped on this call. Uh, second of all, uh, thank you all for explaining this economic challenge in a way that I can digest it uh, very comprehensively. Everyone did a great job of explaining it. Um, I hate to hear about that budget deficit in California, and I hate to hear that Illinois is about $10 billion uh, on the downside when it comes to infrastructure. Uh, and I hate to hear that, uh, you know, amazing states like Maryland can't afford to repair the cost of 70 year old schools. Uh, but Rhode Island and New Mexico have gotten people on board. And I'm happy to see at a national scale, everyone get on board with this. My question is, uh, looking back at what uh, uh, Roosevelt slash Herbert Hoover were able to do uh, with, the, with, the, with the bridge in San Francisco Bay and Hoover Dam, it sounds like uh, a good sale to the American people would be uh, the fact that it'll, you know, supply 25 million jobs. But I think a, a really great sale is the fact that we'll be buying domestically things like steel uh, and copper and things that go into building the infrastructure. Uh, that was something I wasn't um, as privy to um, originally. Is there any way that I could be more useful? Because I'm seeing a lot of delegates and people at the state level who are able to bring this uh, cause to the forefront, to the people who are also serving in office every day. Uh, but I'm thinking about how can I explain this to the average Joe in a beneficial way? Are, is there any advice to how I can provide this information to the average Joe in a way that they can see this as beneficial to them uh, and why they should go to the, uh, to the ballot box and make sure they vote uh, for Democrats at this point until we can get Republicans on board uh, mm -hmm. to make sure that we get this implemented passed and then we have a permanent infrastructure that you don't have to do, uh, you know, with... You don't have to worry about there being a congressional battle every two to four years. Uh, we just have that infrastructure bank uh, that's going to provide everyone with everything they need on the supply side. Thank you. Sure. Um, first of all, where are you from, Daryl? Uh, I'm from the state of Louisiana, uh, where the infrastructure, oh. uh, there are billions, I mean billions, just in roadways for here in the city of Shreveport. So at the state level, if you're not New Orleans, uh, you're probably not going to get any investment dollars. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I, I would imagine Louisiana needs some help uh, with uh, New Orleans and sea level rise and that sort of thing. And, and to me, one of the best features of the National Infrastructure Bank is that um, every individual community or area will be able to prioritize the projects that are, that are most important to them. And so it really offers a lot of local control. Um, but I would say uh, going to our website and downloading that flyer would be a great first step in terms of having something readily available that you can pass out and use to help educate the people you interact with on a daily basis. But Alfeca, what, what ideas do you have? Uh, Louisiana, we've got a slide on. Daryl, I'll send you the Louisiana slide. But uh, the, the state needs Thank a lot you. of work, as you point out, needs roads. The, the city of New Orleans needs uh, levee protection and, um, you know, new um, wetlands built. I mean, they've got salt incursion in their water right now. The, uh, the big picture is all of the oil refineries need protection from increasing storms. Uh, and every time there's a hurricane that comes through, of course, all of the electric wires go down. So the whole state needs a lot of work. Uh, and um, in addition to housing and transportation and other things, there's lots to be done. And almost anybody that you can talk with, uh, you can make a case for an infrastructure need that this National Infrastructure Bank will finance. Okay. Thank you for your interest, Daryl, and get on our website and download that flyer. We really appreciate your, your participation. Okay, I'd like to bit. go to uh, Delegate Wu, and could you maybe elaborate for us the um, the impact that that uh, barge uh, running into the bridge has caused there in Maryland? Uh, sure, sure. Thank you for raising that issue. It indeed is a, is a huge, uh, even the key bridge, right? I, yeah, yeah, yeah. So right now we haven't really totally cleaned up the bridge yet. So every there are thousands of workers have been impacted. So this year our state, our new budget, just added lots of a few weeks of a session, we provided two hundred fifty million dollars to really help those workers who have been impacted. So some of workers are now kind of taking a bus, try try travel to Virginia Beach. There's another port work there, like daily. And so it's, it's a big impact to those families. And then 
we don't know how to really handle the, the large input through Baltimore port. So we try to divert them to, to New York and other parts. And that's a long-term shift. We don't know what the eventual impact that. But right now, the immediate impact is how do we rebuild that bridge? So I I think the problem, like we really don't have a clear idea for such a big project. It it would build in 1947 or something. I forget it. 57. <laughs> oh, 70, 70, 70, 74 or something. And uh, 72, 72. It takes five years to build at that time, around five years. Now people said it takes 10 years. Uh, and uh, I think both the funding needs and then the regulations and then the workers and really we don't see that it comes soon enough. So that's the reason our governor Wes Moore had been talking to our congressional delegation and all eight of them actually had a bill for the Congress. Ask them to fund that first because there, there will be litigation between the state of Maryland, city of Baltimore with the company, but that may take years. We don't want that dragged out. We really want it from the, the Congress to appropriate some money and just jumpstart this project. And uh, it's, it's really a huge need for Maryland. It impacts so many aspects for, for people in Maryland. So every year, there are 11 million cars use that, use that um, bridge, 11 million now because between Baltimore and the other side of Maryland, there's another tunnel because that bridge really transported like high risk material. So they were not allowed to go tunnel. That means they take they need to turn a route on 695. That's another at least 30 miles. Use heavy, heavy traffic. And uh, probably people heard about traffic in Maryland, pretty bad. Beltway, 695, all of them pretty bad. These were added to that you really get that traffic situation even much worse than what it has now. Thank you, Delegate Wu, for um, sharing that with us. Uh, you, you know, everyone on this call obviously has access to broadband or you wouldn't be on the phone call. So I was really pretty shocked to hear Ray Ellen Smith rattle off that list of statistics of all the households in New Mexico that don't have access to broadband, don't have running water, don't have electricity. And um, and it could very well be that there are significant numbers in other states around the country as well. And I'm wonder, wondering, Ray Allen, where did you find those statistics? Is that something that the state compiled? Or how would people in other states be able to get that data for their areas? Um, I've, I found all that in uh, some of the data sets our state produces um, that are on you know the governmental websites and things like that. We have... Um, a lot, we have 19 Pueblos and three Native American tribes here in New Mexico. I think that's right. Um, and a lot of those are in, you know, ancestral lands like Taos Pueblo's been there since, you know, at least 4,000 years, something like that. Um, and, a, and a lot of those are in very remote areas and it's, it's, um, it's difficult to get uh you know some of these infrastructure things to them there's a there's a small town um just west of albuquerque about 35 miles called tahajali that our uh congresswoman was able to get about nine million dollars for to finally pipe them in water now they're 30 miles from albuquerque <laughs> the biggest city in the state and uh, they're finally gonna get um, water and they don't have to drive their pickup trucks uh, to the center of town and uh, pick up water to take to their homes anymore. So it, it's just really remarkable, but I found all the data on our state websites. Hmm, amazing. Yeah, that would be um, something I think I'm gonna look up for my state and see what I can find out. But it, it's interesting to hear that you have concerns with access to broadband in Maryland, which is a small state. They have concerns about that access there too. So exactly. it probably is you know, a, a concern around the country. But uh, let's go to Washington state. We've got Ingrid Clare with her hand up. Ingrid, do you have a question or a comment? Um, well, I'd like to hear what Nomi um, friends was wanted to say because she had her hand up for a while. Oh, and, okay. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't see it. And also, 
also, if Alfeca has time to show some of the slides of the infrastructure that we're looking at, um, you know, you have those little diagrams of what, where the money would go or what we're looking at. And then also the water, bringing it from the East Coast to the West Coast, something like that. I think those are interesting ideas that some people would like to hear about. Okay, um, Nomi, did you? Did you have a comment or that you? Yeah, you know, um, thanks, Julian. Thanks, oh. um, Ingrid. I am um, when I was listening to Daryl and then also to um, Delegate Wu. I I was thinking that you know we're talking about how to sort of reach this across the aisle because we all know the infrastructure is um you know uh, is a bipartisan need and use. Uh, but um, on the commodity side, it, it is another component, like a subcomponent of, of this, which I think does concern um, also people on both sides of the aisle, um, is the use or production of more steel or more or better processes for steel or for copper or for iron ore or for um, rare earth elements to, to build out the infrastructure that we're talking about. So even though we aren't necessarily talking about how the supply of materials actually gets used, there would be more people working on the processing um, of those materials. There would be more people involved in the engineering and use of those materials and building or upgrading our infrastructure. So even though we're talking about the sort of end products, the roads, the bridges, the the, the hospitals, the schools, the housing, um, the, the high-speed trains, we're also talking about a significant um, increase in domestic supply use and processing, which also creates more jobs and also allows us from a national security perspective to be more in charge of where our supply chain goes, um, because we would have to produce and process more uh, at home in order to build the infrastructure. So there's all of these other knock-on economic and individual um, impacts that, that the National Infrastructure Bank would be basically supporting um, by extension as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, and then uh, Ingrid had a question about some of the slides, maybe um, that you've used, Alfeca. So sure, I can okay. uh, I can run through just a few of these, uh, you know, standard slides that we use in our presentations to kind of give you a flavor for what the National Infrastructure Bank will cover. Uh, first of all, five trillion in in projects. Uh, nobody's got a number like that. Um, we take our estimates of need from the American Society of Civil Engineers. They track all of the maintenance things and the bridges that we need to repair and, and that kind of thing, the water systems. And we take their uh, funding on the, uh, the funding estimates on the money. And then we added things we think are also critical. They're not normally thought of as public infrastructure, but we think that they are. And so we've put in $1.1 trillion for high-speed rail, uh, money and uh, adequate money for broadband. We're the only uh, bill that's got adequate financing for affordable housing targeted to the very lowest income earners who are really, really struggling. They're paying more than 50% of their income, uh, their family income on housing, and that's just not acceptable. They, um, they're really struggling to pay the rent. And then these large scale water projects in areas where we grow our nation's food. So looking at it sector by sector, we wanna work on homelessness. We've, we've studied a lot about why the federal system for addressing homelessness is not working. It's underfunded. The states are not able to pick up the slack. Um, we absolutely need to do something. This is a crisis in uh, in America. And as I mentioned, uh, uh, rents and housing prices are up 60% in the last decade and people are struggling. Uh, we wanna get all the lead out of the lead service lines. Uh, what the EPA has uh, said, fix them all in 10 years. They gave no money out of the budget. Uh, we can do this, we can organize it. There was just an article yesterday in the Washington Post saying uh, this by a professor saying that really uh, it's it's a question of money and it's also a question of logistics and better organization because it's every utility sort of for themselves across the country. And this National Infrastructure Bank will mobilize better to get these lead service lines out of the ground, especially the lines from the street to the house that are on the owner's property um, and are not getting funded. I mean, that's only half of the picture to fix the, uh, the pipes in the street. We absolutely need to do something with our power grid. Uh, it's very subject to storms and wildfires uh, having to do with climate change. And uh, the big 
bump up in demand this year is very, very concerning. We're producing uh, um, renewable energy with wind and solar, but we haven't got a way to move it from one place in the country to another. All that needs to be worked on and the bank can do that. And we need to ensure our water supplies to areas where we grow our nation's food. We have a specific uh, plan in mind for bringing water that's not being used anywhere. It's just being dumped into the uh, Gulf of Mexico, uh, scooping it all up and taking it up with an aqueduct uh, to the Colorado River system. This will help seven states and 40 million residents to ensure their water supplies and their electricity supplies uh, from that system, in addition to other water projects that we can do around the area. So we want to take a big picture look at all of the nation's problems, and we want to mobilize, better mobilize, and get timely projects out into all these uh, infrastructure areas. So I'll just stop there. Hey, thanks, Alpeca. Uh, we've had a couple people ask about um, public facing documents or information. Are any of those slides available on the website? Yes, they they all are on the on the uh, main homepage. Uh, you can go down to the slideshow. And if you want to look at your state slides, they're in the next block of slides down below. Okay, very good. NIBcoalition.com. Okay, um, Delegate Wu, you've got your hand up. Uh, well, yes, well, whether you can share that slide. But uh, you said it on your website. I'm lo I, I'm checking. Thank you. Is it on the and, action page, Alfeca, or where is it on the website? It's on the, it's on the home page, nibcoalition.com. If you scroll all the way down, you'll see the, the slide decks, and you can scroll through them. And by the way, uh, Delegate Wu, uh, we have $250 uh, billion in the National Infrastructure Bank just for schools alone. <laughs> All right. I, I like it. I like it. I really love oh, good. it. <laughs> it's very flexible and uh, offers the widest range of um, potential areas for investment. So there have been other uh, infrastructure bills that have been out there, but they've been far too small, not enough money, not enough flexibility to be able to address the variety of needs that we have across the country. And I think that's something that's um come out loud and clear in this conversation is the, the needs that we have around the country and, and um, the importance of being able to address those. So that brings us to the end of our presentation this evening. So I wanna thank everybody, especially our speakers for being here and uh, sharing with us the um, their thoughts on the National Infrastructure Bank. Here's our website again, nationalinfrastructurebank.com or nationalinfrastructure, nibcoalition.com. We do have a Facebook page, so please feel free to visit that. Email us at the e email address you see there. We are happy to work with you in your area. Uh, we're happy to help do presentations for your elected officials, your congressperson, your mayor, your city council. And so we really want to work with you and with your state to develop more interest and more co-sponsors for our proposed legislation. So, so thanks again, everyone. Really appreciate you know, being here and uh, we look forward to working with you in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night.